Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome. This is Build With Me. And again, we have a wonderful episode in store. We have a special guest star that we're going to be answer, uh, We're going to be introducing in just one moment. But this is the episode. We're going to be talking about how you can be bootstrapping your idea, how we can start taking that action to launch your idea. So before we begin, come with me. As always, again, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And let us know where you're watching this from. Are you going to be on Twitch? Are you watching on YouTube? Let me know down below and what platform you're watching this on and where you're watching from today. If you're in Australia, Mark, Nyota over there in the Midwest. Uh, we got people in San Fran. Oh, Dan, we've got people all over flying in. So thanks so much for, for being here. And uh, this is going to be a special episode. Uh, again, we're all about for you to take action and our guest today, uh, we're seeing this in action. So first of all, we'd like to uh, wait. Hold on, we got new sound effects coming up. Wait a minute, I totally forgot. Now we got we have coming up to the stage. We have Andy from Data Fletcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Andy, how are we doing today? Yeah, great. Thanks. How you doing? Good. So uh, for the audience that is uh, that they're not might not be familiar with you right now, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so my background is in software development. Um, so I studied kind of engineering at university and then moved into like, uh, yeah, kind of conventional software engineering after that. Um, I did mainly front end stuff, um, but also some some back end as well. Um, I started contracting. I kind of jumped around to like various different startups and agencies and stuff. Um, but the whole time I was kind of doing projects on the side. So trying to, yeah, start my own thing, uh, like a lot of, of developers and, and non-developers as well. Um, and kind of, a lot of them didn't go anywhere. Um, so I tried them with friends and on my own and yeah, had like one or two that were just, I don't know, you get a few users for a few days and couldn't get anyone to come back. Um, definitely didn't make any money. And then in 2019, I had the first one that kind of actually made some money, um, which was I basically figured out like a way to scrape TikTok. Um, this was kind of just before lockdown, just before TikTok really blew up and became like a household name. Um, and so basically I found a way to like scrape it and then sell that data to marketing agencies um, and basically built like a SaaS around that. Um, that allowed them to kind of like discover who the biggest inf like influencers on TikTok, who had the biggest following, whatever, uh, who, who do they want to work with. Um, and so that kind of went somewhere um, and it grew quite quickly for a few months. Um, so I grew it up to like a few thousand dollars in like MRR. Um, but the whole time I was kind of thinking like, TikTok's not gonna be around forever. This is built on scraping, it could go to zero at any point. And like, you know, maybe China's gonna come and, you know, take me in the night or something. So I was kind of like a little bit worried and wanted to, to kind of get get out and get into something more sustainable. Um, so I basically sold it um, for kind of, um, not a life changing amount of money, but like a amount of money that kind of allowed me to take like a few months off and keep working on my own projects. Um, sold it to an American company and then spent a couple of months looking for the new idea and then got into this new one, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit more detail, but it's Data Fetcher. It's a, an app on Airtable's marketplace and it lets you kind of connect Airtable to other platforms using APIs. That's awesome. That's great to hear. And yeah, I can't wait to to hear about this more. Uh, real quick, so a lot of people are in the chat already talking to Lee, who's also in the UK, is talking about, hey, Doc and Andy, nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, also, Erica, Erica, man, you're just everywhere. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, and, and let me know if anyone, uh, if I missed anyone. I see a couple people coming in as well. Nyota, I know you're going to be here in a second, so thank you so much. All right, so this is good. This is good. So, okay, so you took that idea, and um, so how you how what language were you using to scrape? Were you using Python? How what's what's your background? What language were you using? Uh, so JavaScript and then TypeScript, which is very similar to JavaScript. Um, so yeah, basically that combined with like um, I had some experience doing like mobile apps using React Native. So like there's some native. Functionality. I actually had two physical phones set up playing TikTok all day, <laughs> scrolling through TikTok all day, um, and some kind of, yeah, like a sort of, yes, yeah, quite complicated, but like a proxy thing in between the two that meant anytime that like some data went from Wi Fi to the phone, it went through into my database first. Um, so yeah, but it was all JavaScript. Um, and then, yeah, so like Node and stuff on the back end and then React on the front end. That's great. By the way, uh, Mike Rubini from last week, no, two weeks ago, I'm losing track of time in the audience. 
uh, from Trendly and all of the crazy stuff that he does. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. All kinds of people jumping into the chat today. Um, so that's really good. Um, and you were talking about now, did you go to school to learn this or were you in a totally different industry when you were at uh, school? Uh, so I did engineering um, mm -hmm. at university. So I did basically like general engineering. Um, so mm -hmm. the you know, I went to like you didn't specialize into an individual type. You just kind of did a bit of everything. So um, we didn't really do much software stuff. Um, I kind of picked that up after university when I realized I didn't really want to be like a mechanical engineer or something like that. I wanted to do something where I could kind of like do my own thing a bit a bit quicker. Um, and that's kind of why I chose software. Um, also just financially and stuff like that, it seemed like a better career than kind of traditional engineering. Um, so essentially what I did after I graduated was move home for a few months um, and just kind of learned through like free code camp, um, loads of like online YouTube videos and stuff like that, just kind of taught myself to code for four, four or five months and then, and then got a job off the back of that. Good times. Love it. Love it. Love it. So now we have on the screen kind of alluding to you went from uh, having a company, uh, selling it now, which going over to data, data um, fetcher that I owe. And we have that. And by the way, in the links down below, make sure you check it out. We already dropped it in the YouTube and also for Twitch chat, all of those things. You'll see that link. I'm going to drop it again. Tell me a little bit about this project. How did you stumble across this? How did you get started? All that stuff. Sure. Yeah. Um, so just after I sold um, the TikTok business, I spent a couple of months trying to just essentially just go through an ideation process to come up with like a new idea. Um, so trying to basically just, yeah, like launch another SaaS that was um, would kind of sustain me and give me a good lifestyle um, and not be as, as fragile as the, the scraping one. Um, and that was quite a tough process, to be honest. There's um, so many things that you have to consider um, and so many different um, kind of I guess, uh, yeah, like different different things to consider that it just made it like I find that quite brutal. Um, and so I spent um, a lot of like weeks just doing like I'm just gonna do a project for a week and see what what happens. Um, and this was when like newsletters were really hot. Um, and so I kind of one of my first ideas was like I'll do a sort of IPO alerts newsletter. Um, and so like I'll basically because you know like retail investors don't hear about IPOs super quickly, and so what if I could come up with like a way to basically alert people, there's gonna be one this week, like you should, it's gonna launch on Thursday. Um, and so I kind of made this like little landing page and I wanted to manage all the IPOs data um, in the back end. And I kind of used Airtable for that. And I wanted to pull in stock prices. Um, and there wasn't an easy way to like pull stock prices into Airtable. Um, anyway, that's not when I had the idea, but that was clearly the seed of it. Cause I then basically parked it. I, I sacked off the IPOs um, idea cause someone was already I don't know, I just didn't particularly rate it. Um, I didn't know enough about finance to know like, how to find people and stuff. Um, but then like a month later, I'd gone through a couple more ideas. I went on Product Hunt um, that day and I was just looking through kind of old like listings and stuff. And there was an app there called, or a Google Sheets ad on there called API Connector. Um, mm -hmm. and this is uh, made by a woman called Anna, um, who I'm now connected with and we kind of help each other out and stuff. But she said she had a hundred thousand users, um, including like companies like Uber and stuff were using it. Um, so she's clearly quite successful. She had like a freemium model where most of it was free, but then if you wanted like a certain number of requests, it was paid. Um, and she clearly seemed to be doing quite well. And that's when the penny dropped. Of basically, I had this exact problem, but in Airtable. Um, there's no Airtable way to do this. It's clearly worked for Google Sheets. Um, and I was like, could I make something that wraps Airtable or like an extension for Airtable? Um, and just through kind of sheer luck, Airtable's app marketplace had just been launched. Um, so this was like last summer. They just basically allowed anyone to kind of, or like launch an SDK that meant that like a developer like me could launch apps on top of their app, app marketplace. Um, and so it was just, yeah, great timing. So um, I basically wrote the app and it was one of the first apps on, on the app marketplace once they opened it up. Um, there were a few apps already, but they were all like type form and, and really big players like that. This was mm -hmm. the first time that kind of just independent like developers could could launch stuff. That was perfect timing. Perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, they, uh, you can't ask more than that. Um, also, too, some people in the chat were asking SDK software development kit. So that's that's good. That's good. And um, also, so this is we got some questions coming in already coming in hot for you. OK, so um, you saw an opportunity in another market and then you basically 
looked at this vertical and could replicate the same thing that was successful in the what is that called the Google marketplace now I forget what that's called yeah, but, um, Google, I'm not sure the add-ons marketplace <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> yeah um, it's actually very similar to what I did with the TikTok thing which was look at tools that work for Instagram because there was loads of Instagram marketing tools um, TikTok was overtaking Instagram in terms of influencers always like a new kind of wild west territory and then just build all the exact same tools but with on the new platform i think it's a very like quite a nice way to get started if you're kind of a one person you know solopreneur or whatever just to basically just be like i'm not going to reinvent the wheel but i am going to go to a new platform that's taken off because there's going to be less competition less um yeah like less existing players and less kind of um it's going to be easier just for when people saw both of these tools a lot of people are just like this is exactly what i need and it's the only one that does this now that's not to say competition won't come like already after six months of the TikTok thing loads of competitors launched they were even cloning my landing pages and stuff like that and i'm sure in the next few months like people are going to copy data fetcher but it does give you a nice like six month head start where you can then get a load of customers and just stay ahead of the competition by a few months which i think really makes it a lot easier when you're kind of a one-person team Love it. Love it. And, uh, I'll, and you're talking to an audience, a lot of the, the audience right here, uh, let us know in the comment section down below who's working on this either by yourself, a solo founder, or maybe if it's a dual, uh, team Lee, I know I'm looking at you. Lee has, is working with Edmund and launching, uh, what I think you launched on bubble. My, the stash I'm going to hold on a second. I'll, I'll drop the link. Lee, I see you. I see you over there, but Lee has a question for you, by the way. Hold on one second. Um, yeah, Lee's question is: selling that TikTok project. How did you find a buyer? Did you go to a marketplace? Did you just know someone? Um, yeah, could you talk about that for a moment? Yeah, of course. Um, so I looked at a few of the marketplaces. Um, a lot of the marketplaces, like FE International, uh, Micro Acquire, and stuff like that, they want you to be kind of at least twelve months old. Um, a lot of the like more official brokers. To have 12 months of like financial statements and stuff just to prove that it's a bit more of a legitimate business um so i couldn't go through a broker um i looked at flipper which is probably the most well-known one for like selling tools like that um the issue i found with flipper was and i still maybe should have gone for it but basically if you list on flipper if you sell it in the next like three months even if you sell it like through someone you met on twitter or linkedin or whatever tw uh, flipper still want a commission they want i think 10 percent um, because they're kind of they don't want people listing on there and then cutting them out and and going around them. Um, so I was like, that was kind of my backup option was to go on Flipper, and I still wonder if I could have got more on there. But what I essentially did was just um, write up a post, put it on, I put it on Indie Hackers, a few Slack groups, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Hacker News. It got quite a bit of traffic on Hacker News, uh, just like a bunch of different places. Um, so maybe not the widest net, but it seemed to get like quite a few people interested. I did also put it on micro acquire actually, um, thinking back. So they didn't have the one year limitation. I think that was just the more official brokers. Um, so yeah, I basically put it through a bunch of places like that. Loads of stuff came in into email. Um, all the questions, the same questions like kept coming up like the same, I don't know, like what was the tech stack? What was, how have you find customers, all this stuff. So then what I did was basically turn all those questions into like a massive Google doc. Um, basically just like answering like all yeah the, the FAQs um and then kind of reshared everything with with that Google Doc um and that worked quite nicely because you know on a Google Doc you can see when everyone else is looking at it I think that did kind of create like a little bit of competition of everyone's kind of competing with you know anonymous doubt like Badger and stuff um so everyone could kind of see that um and then yeah a bunch of offers kind of came in off off the back of that and it only took I think it took about a month um from listing it to kind of having the the cash in the bank Good times. I like it. That and then that allowed you to now focus and go over here. This is great. Mm -hmm. Um, there. Oh, and we're getting thank you. Thank you so much for for answering that. All right, excellent. Keep it coming. Keep these questions coming. This is good. So, Andy, tell me a little bit about um your process when you were just getting started with adding this to the marketplace. Were you worried about? it needing to be perfect, perfect landing page. Tell me about the launch or how fast, when you found out that you could be launching your own, um, uh, your, basically, what do they call it on Airtable? It's not an add-on, do, do they say script or no? no? It's an app, it used to be a block, but it's an app now. 
Got it. Got it. Got it. So when you're launching your app, how long did it take you? Were you thinking about it before you just did it? Uh, did you, you know, sit on it for a couple of weeks or a couple of hours before you do it? Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like validation stuff, I didn't do like using that framework that I mentioned earlier. In some ways, the validation is already done in that the product already works on another platform and on another very, very similar platform. So I didn't do like a bunch of, I don't know, like user research and like going out and like finding people. I looked at like similar tools and I could see people doing, you know, like I knew about like Zapier and Integromat and knew that kind of, you know, wiring two services up, one of them being Airtable is a pretty common use case. I wasn't super concerned with like validating every single, you know, user story or whatever. Um, so instead basically just, yeah, just start coding. Um, I spent like a month doing the initial um, app um, and then the difficult bit initially was like Airtable app review took two months and that was, yeah, that was kind of a trying two months of just like going back and forth with like their design feedback and stuff. That was the disadvantage of it being so new on the app store is they, yeah, like their process was a little bit slow, um, but it was really good. Like they kept me informed the whole time. I agreed with most of their design feedback. It just took a while sometimes. Um, so that, yeah, that was about two months. And then launched on the App Store, uh, got probably 10 or 20 signups a day for the first week of like free users. And then after a few days or a week, got the first customer. And that was obviously a, a lovely moment to, to feel like it validated like the whole idea just to have one, one paying customer. Um, and then in terms of like, how complete it was it was it was pretty shoddy to be honest um it did just about um what it needed um but there was there's a lot of rough edges um i'm a big sort of proponent of the idea uh, that i can't remember whose quote it is but basically you should be embarrassed by your mvp um i think if you're if you're early stage if you if you don't have a like if you don't have a reputation or anything already then it's absolutely fine to be embarrassed by it um and so yeah it was it was the main thing was just getting users and getting getting some early feedback and stuff. Love it, love it. By the way, Anthony is in the chat. Thank you so much. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for being here and watching. Uh, this is good. Remember, in the questions, let us know what you're building right now, questions about bootstrapping your own SaaS platform, software as a service. Remember all of these questions. And I, I'm looking at you, Lee. Remember, this is the time to ask these questions because I know you're doing that right now. And I'm not putting you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. But all of these questions, you have a founder that's uh, building in public and doing this. Uh, with that transition, too, you were talking about getting that first customer. What I liked about uh, about you, and actually one of my friends referred me to you because we were talking about who should we have on the show. And he's like, you need to talk to Andy because look at what he's doing on Twitter. Look at what he's talking about and being transparent and talking about his, his uh, process. Was that a conscious thing? to start talking about it on Twitter, about how much you're making, your signups, what you're going through? Was that just something natural or did you, is this a plan for your marketing strategy and all of those things to talk about um, data fetcher? Yeah, it's a bit of both. Um, so I did it for the for the last project as well, the TikTok one. Um, I definitely, yeah, wanted to keep doing it. Um, I think it's a double-edged sword and there's, there's, there's pros and cons. I think pros, yeah, it gets you quite a lot of exposure, um, both in terms of like, signups um and i think one thing to think about that is like is it relevant exposure so for a tool like this it is quite quite useful um because you know there's a big twitter community of kind of bootstrappers and no coding people and and kind of entrepreneurs a lot of who will be in your audience and who you'll kind of get exposed to through through sharing like revenue and people are just interested to see um you know your, your little wins and and your but also your tips um also, just for your personal network, like I've met quite a few people um, through doing it that it's kind of like gives you some legitimacy to like to meet them and they they kind of want to connect with you. And then often like I've met kind of people that are, uh, I guess, like a few steps ahead of me, like um, or that, like have had similar success in like different areas. So like I met one guy called Robin Warren, who's like built a tool for uh, Trello, um, who then um, has given me like early feedback and stuff like that. So. I think it's just a, an interesting way to kind of meet and, and promote kind of what you're doing. Um, the downsides are, are definitely like, yeah, I think it attracts probably copycats. Um, I think it, yeah, you basically get, you do get a lot of people that are kind of really early in their journey that kind of reach out and say like, they want to partner with you and, and just kind of like, a, I don't know, like a, like a little bit time wasted like that. Um, 
So like I try and be helpful to those people, but sometimes people literally want you to like, I don't know, they ask like stuff that you've just shared in a tweet and, and kind of, so sometimes it, it can be a little bit um, frustrating, but I think, I don't know, I, I quite like doing it. Um, and yeah, I think it's just, it's nice. Like I appreciate when I see other people doing the same and like you can kind of see not just the, the head, like the stuff that gets the most engagement is how much money did you make? But like the what I try and do is like add a bit of color to it. Like this month, I tried to do a marketing plan or this month um, support's been, uh, I've been drowning in support. This is my plan to solve that. So I think it's important to share that stuff. Um, it's also really important to share the the bad months as well or the bad weeks. So I've been trying to like not just do the wins, but show like our oh, churn was really bad this week. Um, here's what I'm trying to do to, to solve it and stuff. Um, this guy called John Yong Fook, who's got um, Banner Bear. Um, it's like an image API project. He's really good at that. And basically showing like, you know, the ups and downs because um, on a sort of day to day or week to week basis, like there are a lot of ups and downs. Um, it's just on a month to month basis that stuff has generally been going up. That's uh, well, I, I like. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, always refreshing. And by the way, if if you're not following Andy right now, I'm dropping the link right now in a second in the chat section make sure and by the way you heard what he said <laughs> look at the content he's put out don't ask him all the questions he just said right here um, but he really interesting i liked how you broke that down per week uh it, it was very interesting and fascinating and um and mike i'm not sure if mike's in the audience still but re- mike does the same thing with uh his dashboard he refers to people his dashboard and you can see all of his SaaS platforms how much it's making per month and everything like that and just being transparent, it really helps people out. So again, uh, make sure that you're following uh, Andy on Twitter as well. Let me make sure that I drop this in the chat section down below. There we go as well. Okay. And remember too, if you have follow-up questions, I, I know some of you, and uh, yes, some of you remember when we were here uh, that if you have further questions about an app idea, you're going to want to follow up and have something. Um Andy's very busy, but we'll try to, I'll try to contact him and get the answers for you. But remember, if you don't want to put it in the normal chat, remember in the discord, sign up for the discord. Why do we bring that up chat? If you remember someone asked a question live, they were talking about their favorite idea or domain name. Then someone took that domain name. I told them if you want something, uh, this is a public live stream. So uh, you yeah, can't yeah, start complaining yeah, yeah, um, yeah, if your yeah, ideas yeah. get taken here. I'm sorry, but this is public. So if you want to ask questions in the Discord where not everyone can see it, uh, make sure you join the Discord as well. Um, the question, okay, yep. Ah, yep. Good work, Andy. Mike saying good work. That's awesome. Um, Lee's talking about he loves Mike's dashboards. This is great. This is great stuff. Great community. Okay, so... Walk me through just a couple of things. First of all, um, what has been your experience now? How long have you been working on Data Fetcher? I guess almost a year. Has it been just about a year? Uh, it's about six, well, six months since we launched. Um, and then a couple of months for that. So I guess eight or nine months. Yeah. Okay. Eight or nine months. So t- tell me, what was that main feature? Because I, I'm assuming that it's doing more, right? So I'm seeing it can be able to pull in information from different platforms. Did you focus on just one at a time? What was that main feature and then building out? What did it look like? Um, so the main feature it hasn't fundamentally changed because it's the way that it works is basically because users can set up kind of any API request, it's a very flexible tool. Um, and so you don't necessarily like, Whereas with, I don't know, Zapier or something like that, you'd kind of build an integration and then you build another integration and you build another one. Um, are you still there? Yeah, I'm good. Cool. Great. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Um, you just come back for me. Um, here we go. Here we go. Hold on. It's, ah, here I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, because it's kind of low code rather than no code and like users can kind of configure anything, it's not like there's, I had to go like, you know, each. Um, each platform by platform. Instead, it was just like, here's you know, here's the the keys. Like, let here's the toolbox. Let anyone kind of set anything up. Um, so there was no like one big feature. That the fundamental like functionality has always been there. It's like you can put an API URL in. You can put headers. You can put authorization in. Um, but there's obviously lots of like nuances within that. And you know, there's hundreds of different ways of setting up an API request. So there's things like um, pagination, where you can import like multiple pages of data um, or um, OAuth integrations is another one, um, which is basically 
some platforms to work with them. Um, you have to do this complicated system of managing um, authorization tokens in the background. Um, but what I would say is like no one feature has made like a huge difference. Um, and I definitely, I've heard that a hundred times, um, but you definitely, when you when you launch something like, um, so OAuth integrations was a big one where I added the ability to connect to like Google Analytics, Webflow, like all these other APIs. I thought that would make stuff rocket and it, it didn't, it barely made a difference and not even that many people use it. And partly that's me not advertising it enough, but also it's like no one thing is gonna make a huge difference. Um, and so instead it's just, constantly iterating, uh, talking to customers, getting little bits of feedback, um, and then also starting to market. Um, so um, I've done some tests where I've made some YouTube videos and stuff, and and that seems to be leading to, to customers. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of doing a, a schedule of kind of working on product for a few weeks and then uh, working on marketing and kind of switching between those two. Um, yeah. What, what, what has been your process of well, let me ask you this. Do you sometimes get in the weeds that you're just trying, you're in building mode and you, how do you make sure that you're balancing out building and marketing? Because uh, uh, do you naturally like marketing that or you're like, this is just part of the gig. I have to do that. What What's your philosophy when you're doing that? Um, I don't mind it as much as some developers mind it, I don't think. Like I, yeah. I because I can see, I think this, the thing about marketing is it can be really scary and, and and inaccessible, and because it's kind of there's so many different ways to do it and so many different um, types of marketing that often when you've got a project like this or something, you have no idea where to start or like what what could work. Um, so then it's just working back and working out. Okay, can I find a way where if I pull this lever, in a couple of weeks some money comes out here and like where I can actually make a, a tangible difference to the revenue. Um, and so. The best way to do that is just look at your competitors, how are they marketing, or like similar tools, how are they marketing? Um, so kind of similar to my product philosophy of just like copying what others are doing, but slightly changing it. Um, so what I did for that was basically just, yeah, most people do blog posts and YouTube videos and combine those two, so like just standard content marketing. Um, so um, yeah, based on that, I basically spend like a couple of weeks, um, or like a few weeks actually just making like a bunch of different videos for like different APIs. Um, so I've probably got like, six or seven that I did. Um, so I did a load of crypto APIs, a couple of screenshot ones, um, just a couple of different ones. Um, that was based on looking at what are people actually using the tool for already? So like what do my users like, care about and what, what do the customers care about? And just assuming that there's more of those out there. Um, so I made a load of videos and then I've got probably like 10 or 20 customers that I can trace through to those videos based on their usage. Um, and that's, that's when marketing is really fun because it's suddenly like, I spent, I don't know, a Saturday afternoon making a YouTube video, and then a week later, that earned me, you know, like, uh, I don't know, 20 quid a month, or like, indefinitely. Um, and so I, I quite like marketing, because that's, you know, that's, that's quite fun, <laughs> um, having like a, a money machine like that. Um, I think for me, I'm just, I'm not very good at like switching between loads of different things. So I prefer to break it up into like weeks or, or even months of, you know, I'm gonna spend a few weeks improving the product, um, and then switch back to marketing mode. The other advantage of that is you get your kind of better product in your marketing, if that makes sense, because you've done the work to kind of make a, a good product. And then when you're recording a YouTube video of it, you can show off those, those new features. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I approach it. Really good. Remember, in if are you taking notes? I'm taking notes right now. Uh, it, it, as I'm looking at this, I liked what you were talking about having those blocks, making sure that you're you're working in those kind of. It, to me, it sounds like more like sprints of what you're yeah. doing and all of those things. Uh, yeah. Remember that that those are those are gold gold nuggets right there. Remember, what are you doing right now in the comment section? Are you just starting out? Are you thinking about your minimal viable product, uh, the MVP? Are you thinking about your ideas? Let us know in the chat where you are right now. Oh, by the way, uh, we want to recognize. Welcome to build with me. Yeah. Erica, thank you so much. We just saw that you got leveled up. Sabrina just let me know that uh, now you're you're upgraded, you're level two apprentice in the community. So thank you so much uh, for for being here and uh, all the things that you do. Uh, Lee talks about uh, really like that switching between building and marketing. 
That's right. So a lot of people are liking that. Uh, could you talk about this a, a little bit more? Um, you were talking about this marketing. Now, before you said on the other project, when you were selling it, going to indie hackers, doing all those other things, I believe you said that. Uh, what about now when you're doing blog posts or talking about uh, data fetcher? Are you thinking about going to Reddit? Are you thinking about then going to indie hacker? What's your strategy? How do you break that down? Yeah. Um, so I make my main uh, platform that I kind of do updates through and I don't particularly write like blog posts or have a personal blog. I'd love to. I just haven't found the time. So my main thing is just Twitter um, and just kind of posting updates. Um, both as I really noticed with the last project, it's quite nice to look back on in the future and just see uh, each month I did a little thread of, of what I was thinking, like, um, and just kind of using that almost as, as a bit of a blog. Um, uh, yeah, and then in terms of like other platforms, uh, I have a list of places. So when I do like a new, big new version of the app, I have a list of about 10 places where I would do a little update. Um, so that would be the, like the Airtable subreddit. There's a couple of Facebook groups. Um, there's the Airtable forums. I got, yeah, there's probably like eight to 10 where I would just go and post a little thing and I would make it specific to that platform. Um, rather than just completely copy and pasting it. Um, and just basically say, there's a new version out, have a look. Um, the nice thing about like Airtable communities like that at the moment is they're so small that like a little bit of self-promotion like that is kind of okay. Um, obviously if you try to do that in, I don't know, something for like SEO marketing or something, you'd, you'd get banned straight away. Um, so yeah, I kind of like post little updates like that. I have a mailing list as well, um, which, uh, I didn't have on the last project, but it's just, there's no reason not to have it. It's only got a couple hundred people on, but like, it's just worth doing. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of my approach. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't believe in like posting stuff just for the, I don't know, for the sake of post. Like, I think you've got to make, you've got to time it and not overdo it and make it, you've got to make sure it's relevant. Um, but the problem with that stuff is it's kind of like one and done, unless something goes viral, which, I've never really like tried to do or tried to figure out. I think the, the better approach is trying to find like a scalable channel. So with something like YouTube, you can basically like, there's probably 500 different APIs that I could make a YouTube video on. And even if each of those is getting, you know, 10 views a month, that's, you know, 5,000 views a month that will then go lead to customers. So I think it's more about finding a scalable one, which is basically means SEO or, or YouTube. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, so, as you're doing this now, you're. Do you have a team, or is it just you? It's just me. How do you keep that sanity? <laughs> how, do you, <laughs> how do you do this as yeah. as you're going forward? Yeah, um, it's definitely it's definitely tiring at times. Um, until a couple of weeks ago, I also was contracting full time as as developer, um, and that was that was too much. I was I was pretty stressed. Um, the main thing with that is yeah, trying to do support and marketing and feature stuff and a full time job was 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 knackering. Um, so yeah, quitting contracting now that I can kind of live off savings a bit more and, and the revenue, um, that's really helped. And then, um, beyond that, I think there's been a couple of things. So one, um, I'm in a community called weekend club. Um, that's kind of a, uh, London, like bootstrappers community. Um, it's really good. It's like 20 pounds a month or something, uh, maybe 15 and it's, basically just a bunch of people doing similar projects. Um, I'm in a mastermind through that as well. And like, it's just like a sort of accountability and support like network, um, but it's just full of like very, very like supportive people doing similar stuff. So if you have like, I don't know, if, like there was a couple of months ago when the revenue went down, um, it went down like a couple of hundred dollars. And I just had a bit of a crisis of confidence where I was just like, is this even gonna work? Like everyone's canceling all this stuff. I put a post in there like, does anyone want to chat about it? And I had like four calls the next day that just sorted me out and everyone was just like, you just need to be patient. Like, it just completely got me back on track. Um, so that's just been really good for like, yeah, the kind of mental health slog of it, I guess. Um, and then other than that, I think just like this, I guess it's another perk of like building in public is each time you have a little win and stuff, like you do kind of have like a bunch of people that are, are kind of cheering you on and, and involved in it. So even though I haven't got like a co-founder, um, just having like, other people involved is, is really nice. Um, and I think it's also just like important to share it with family and friends. So like when you have wins or you hit milestones and stuff, just trying to like get other people involved in, in the journey probably helps a bit as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not gonna pretend it's not really time consuming. I think my main, my first person that I'd love to like get on board to help would just be a part-time support person. Um, so if I could get someone off Upwork or something to do 
technical like the customer support for a couple of hours a day i think and you know that's not going to cost a, a huge amount i think that would be that would make it a lot easier makes sense um first of all thank you so much for these thoughts and uh and sharing uh we we've got a question real quick let's see about this thank you so much uh trip killer hello so after quitting the full-time gig did you feel any sense of urgency making you think faster yeah um, so, yeah yeah that's a, that's a good question um i don't think yeah there's definitely like it definitely felt very very liberating and very like exciting just to have the time to devote to it i always felt like when i was you know like full-time contracting i was just trying to you know just trying to keep like users happy and i was always just in support never really had time to like sit down and and think about well one get into like really like meaty big new features and like the marketing plan but also just thinking about like longer term like i don't know like bigger problems so things like um how do i kind of onboard users and how, how do i like manage cancellations and stuff like that and just really like stepping back a bit and thinking about some of those like it's nice just to have time to go for a walk and, and think about that kind of stuff um in terms of like urgency i don't like i'm not super stressed about it i think the the, the kind of bigger privilege of of being a software developer who's had contract roles and stuff is there's quite a lot of work out there so even if in six months it doesn't work out that nicely like i yeah i'm not gonna be kind of on the street like that that's the that's the beauty of um kind of the tech industry at, at the moment how long that will last for i don't know yeah yeah that's really good uh and by the way and thank you for that a lot of people are saying thank you for the conversations bringing this up so this is really good really good andy um also too some are asking okay well wait a minute doc like you talk about no code low code why are we talking about all this tech? because remember it doesn't matter what you're using um this this show is made for you to start seeing the the inner workings of whatever company if you're coding if you're using low code no code whatever it is if you're looking at it there's a this through line that everyone's dealing with the same kind of things as they're getting users as they're having this experience so uh, don't feel bad if you're using bubble if you're using a dollar listen you're still needing to find customers you're still going to need to do the same thing so if you have any questions if you're coding if you're going to be using bubble low code whatever it is still feel free to drop your question in the comment section down down below we want to hear it so this is excellent um andy uh could you talk a little bit about um where you're thinking about going with this product oh you know what no one question before that out of because there's always that 80 20 rule and all those things could you describe your best kind of customer that's using data fetcher could you go into that a little bit yeah sure um so the one that's come up a few times i think is Someone who's um, kind of semi-technical, so they're not they're not following on a YouTube video and just struggling to keep up with like every single bit, or, or kind of making yeah, like they're not completely um, like one hundred percent no code. So they've got like maybe some experience. Maybe it's like writing a little script in Airtable, or they've they've kind of used Integromat or like something like that. Um, someone like that who's kind of running like a small small business, and so they've got the ability to basically like make purchases so um yeah i've dealt with cust like you know companies where clearly the end user is not the person with the purchase you know ability and that's a bit of a nightmare but so people who are kind of like running consultancies or, or small startups and stuff like that um who are kind of semi-technical and have been looking yeah have been like manually importing data or i don't know using like um like another tool um but just kind of want like a, a neater way to do it and not to have to because the problem with a lot of tools is, you know, it's adding like another tool, you're basically constantly switching between tabs and like it's kind of inconvenient, like working like across like two different tools. But like the, the nice thing about like Airtable apps is it lets you do it like right there within um, within the app. Um, in terms of like use cases, uh, I couldn't really like pick an industry or like tell you one industry. There's, I like every day I'm surprised by how many different things people are like using it to do. Um, in the last week I've had, Someone importing from a vineyard CRM, <laughs> uh, someone importing from a sewing, like yeah, sewing and thread social network called Ravelry. Um, there's just like wow. yeah, um, the long the long tail is like longer than I ever expected, but like that's that's really nice because it means um, there's not 
you know, there's not a Zapier integration for this Vineyard CRM. Like people need to use a completely flexible tool like this. That's interesting. Okay, okay. And by the way, um, Trip Killer is talking about good. You seem to have a measured approach to the extra time. So that's that's excellent. Oh man, that's that's really interesting. Was there one the sewing one's interesting. Was there one that just really you're like, I don't I just never imagined ever someone using it like that? To be honest, probably the sewing one. Um, <laughs> I looked I looked into it and like this it's quite a big company. It's called Ravelry, it's like the sewing social network. It was founded like 10 or 15 years ago, and it's basically people, it's a bit like Pinterest or something where people share um, different like threads and stuff. And it's like, I think it's like a five person company that's like, yeah, clearly like had some success and longevity and stuff. But um, and it's got like millions of users, it's got a Wikipedia page and stuff. But yeah, someone someone signed up as a customer, like they weren't just like a free user, they actually converted because they want to import like so many like threads patterns into a table or something. Like, <laughs> I was like, there's no way I would have guessed to make like a YouTube video or something for that person. Um, and also like, I don't know, it was kind of surprising that some, you know, like you think of the typical, you know, like, I don't know, like person who's doing knitting, you might not think of them as, as kind of working with low code and APIs and stuff. Like, it's yeah. a very different market. Um, that's crazy. But, you know, there's, there's people right there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. Uh, we got another question. Is there a licensed API for this for people making SaaS incubators or specialized tool set portals? Hmm. So that's trip killer. So yeah, is there a license API for this? So I guess for data fetcher? Um a licensed API. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Maybe they could yeah. expand a little bit. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's lots of relevant APIs that they could use to like help manage their business, but I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, tell us more. Tell us more. Um also we're getting this. Uh, I knew it was only a matter of time. <laughs> I knew a matter of time someone would bring this up in the chat. Okay. Um, how did you figure out pricing? <laughs> so, <laughs> how did you break this down? What's going on with this? Please talk about this. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, pricing is always a, a finger in the air thing. It's famously hard to do. Um, so, you know, a good place to start is existing tools. So, I mentioned I copied a Google Sheets add on. Um, I kind of based it on on their pricing, um, quite quite similar. Um, in terms of like model though, so obviously there's loads of, you, know, you can do free trials, you can do, um, you know, free freemium, which is what I've mm -hmm. gone for. Um, and so um, I looked at, because, you know, Airtable apps are it's such a new thing, there was not really anywhere, any existing apps to look at and copy. Um, so kind of look, I thought like, what's a similar type of marketplace, which is Shopify, which is obviously very mature and stuff. A lot of Shopify apps use freemium pricing. Um, and so you'll get a certain amount for free each month and you can kind of keep using that indefinitely. But if you want to upgrade, if you want to do more than that, then you need to like, buy a paid plan. Um, so that's what I went for. Um, and then my other kind of consideration was basically um, what's going to cost me money. So when people schedule stuff to like run overnight, or whatever, that obviously leads to some, you know, small, but like significant uh, server costs. So if I had, thousands of free users or hundreds even like doing scheduled stuff overnight that's going to cost me money and so my thought there was like maybe that's the price worth paying to get them to upgrade but let's be conservative to start off with and so what i said is scheduled requests are like a paid feature you can see on the bottom there um that you basically have to upgrade and then i just knew that if someone's like you know scheduling stuff i'm going to be making a profit on them i might change that in the future um it might be worth it but like for now i'm not haven't done that um and then in terms of like the actual prices um yeah i looked at like zapier integral map api connector and like just a bunch of other products i started quite a bit lower i started the bottom plan was 12 a month and then realized that it was going to take a lot of 12 months 12 like dollars a month customers to get so like, even like a thousand dollars a month in in monthly revenue monthly revenue um so i increased it to 15 and then a couple of months later I increased it to 18 um and it wasn't partly just, it wasn't just like, because I want to raise prices. It was also because I'd added more stuff and made it a better app. And so there's more value there and I could kind of justify charging that. Um, the other thing kind of within that is the usage limits. And and obviously that's a big part of, of the pricing. Um, I've just doubled most of them. Um, not quite doubled, but like increased them all significantly uh, apart from the free one. And that's because a lot of people were saying, this is kind of a bit, like it was a bit stingy and 
like the starter plan, you could only do 750 a month. And so I think for a lot of people that basically meant they were like, this is a bit, you know, you're like you're not giving that much away for my fifth, my eighteen dollars a month, um, and so people were like writing their own scripts to replace it, or or finding another tool and stuff. And so, what I've yeah kind of been looking at is is can I increase them? Um, can I maybe even make them more generous and just get people to stick around for a bit longer? Um, I also didn't want to get to a position where I was like people weren't using the app because they were worried about using up all their usage because you obviously want your customers to be pretty active and stuff. You don't want I don't know people to be stressing about not using it. Um, so yeah, I might I might increase them again. Um, yeah, the, the final thing I say is like most people say would probably say I've got too many plans and that there's too many. Um, you're not supposed to supposed to have like more than three plans with like double digit like monthly amounts. Um, so it's just a little bit a little bit complicated. Um, and so maybe I could I might combine like the pro and the team in, into one. Um, so yeah, it's it's pricing is really really difficult. Um, what has been nice is I've seen a lot of upgrades through the pricing plans. So people start on the starter um, and then they upgrade to, to pro or, or team. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I uh, haven't seen many downgrades, but at the moment the, the kind of upgrades are making up for the lost customers, um, which is really nice and, and quite unusual at this price point. Yeah, that's uh, actually, that was the next question I was going to have. Uh, and Trip Killer has a couple more questions or giving more detail. But I was going to say, too, what I like about what you're saying is it, you're being honest. Pricing is tough. <laughs> it's, it's constantly evolving. And I like how you were talking about your thought process of what you were doing and going through this. So at home, if you're looking at what am I doing with pricing for my SaaS, uh, my micro SaaS, whatever you're doing, remember, think about the process of getting that input, understanding about your customers. What are they saying? Why are they leaving? What are they requesting? And then really making sure that you're having those tangible notes, those uh, key, key performance indicators and those benchmarks to make sure that you're making logical decisions in changing what, what, or making sure you're innovating with pricing. So that that's excellent. I love to hear that. Um, real quick, Trip Killer is talking about and I think this is what he this is what Trip Killer is talking about. So is there a licensed version of Data Fetcher where it can be implemented into a larger app? So I'm thinking about I I guess maybe he's asking, can he integrate other things and not just use it with Airtable? Maybe that's what he's asking. Um I'm still having trouble with that. Um am I miss am I missing something, Andy? Is there something maybe there's yeah, key takeaways? Sure. I quite follow. Um it sounds like either he's asking, can it be Sort of white labeled into another app or something. Um, Maybe. Maybe. Sure. At, at the moment, it is a single platform. So it's just, just Airtable. Um, yeah. app, like it doesn't, it doesn't play with, like you can connect to any other API, but like it's always going to start in Airtable. There's no, um, yeah. I haven't. I haven't built it for Webflow or anything like that. And, and maybe, like you were talking about, you're, you're, and correct me if I'm wrong, because if you're, it's allowing you to get the data, if anyone else is using those APIs, you can be bringing in whatever source if they have API, right? A, a public API yeah. to be able to do it. So it that's depends right. on that side. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So and like, okay. there's obviously loads of different services that have APIs. Um, and yeah, um, like at last count, I had people doing it with, or well, people using 500 different APIs and that's based off like 1200 users. Um, so there's just, yeah, there's so many different services that have them. Um, Obviously, it requires a bit of technical knowledge to, to set up, but um, even a lot of like no coders can, like through following a tutorial and stuff, can can set up an API. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking Trip Killer. I think that's that's the key. I would I would really look at. Um, you're talking about this could be featured uh, of this app. Yeah. It, it, remember, it's going to be based on the other end. If they have the public API, if it can come in here. And uh, remember, if you have more questions or because you're talking about it could be a larger for your business, remember, uh, you can hit up Andy. Remember, there's a link down below. If you have a very specific use case, all of those things, especially if you're using it with a, a or you're thinking about enterprise and those things. Um, remember, that's why we you can hit them up. All of those things. Check out uh, the website. Go to support or uh, Andy, can they hit you up on uh, Twitter? How do you want them to talk? Yeah. To um Either way, DMs on Twitter are probably easier. Okay, cool. Let me um, let me switch that real quick. All right, so I'm just gonna take your da -da -da -da. okay. Hit up Andy here, Trip Killer. Hit him up here. Good stuff. 
Good stuff. All right. Good questions. All right, y'all. So now we're going to transition towards the the end of the program. We're going to be talking about the future, uh, what you're planning. And remember, this is the time in your comment section. What are you working on? Questions that you have on your project. It might just not be about scraping or creating your micro SaaS. Are you creating an MVP and you're not even knowing what platform to create? You don't know what language to use, all those things. All those questions in the section down below, let me know. So uh, as we're going to this next part, Andy, tell me a little bit about what you got planned for the future and what you're going to be doing with Data Fetcher for the rest of 2021. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the, the current focus is on new features. So I've just had, um, as I've been like working full time, there's been so many things that have been asked for like multiple times. And so I'm going to basically like smash through a load of those. I think I'll probably do that for about a month and a half, two months. So just, yeah, like head down development. Um, and then try and get that that next version out. Um, then switch into marketing mode and do hopefully like sort of 50, 100 YouTube videos and blog posts um, for most of the rest of the year. Um, and then just, you know, make sure that content's pretty evergreen that can just like sit there and and, and kind of be there. Um, after that, uh, I'm not sure, probably, probably more like back to development stuff. So kind of switching between the two, as I said. Um, I think long term, the plan would be hopefully try and get it to like, 15, 20, like thousand a month. Um, that would be just amazing. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's, I think that's doable. Um, I think that's doable with like just me. I think if I could do that, then I can get someone on, on support and then potentially like re reinvest that revenue into like another tool or like a kind of related tool. Um, but yeah, that's maybe uh, a couple of years away. I love it. Love it. Love it. No, I love the plan. And also too, I believe I saw on Twitter, you're, you're at uh 2k, uh, yeah, uh monthly yeah, recurring. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I love the updates. I love that you're showing exactly what's happening. You're showing the graphs, what's happening. It, it, it's super, to, it's really interesting to see the journey and I'm glad that, um, that it's working out and I'm, Glad to see what's happening in the future. Uh, for, for the good people, if you're giving one piece of advice back to yourself when you started, uh, what would you do if someone was trying to launch or, or be on the marketplace for Airtable or any kind of marketplace? What would be that one piece of advice you would have for the person? Great question. Um, it's probably, yeah, probably a the theme of the conversation, but it's don't reinvent the wheel. Just don't be afraid to just take what's working somewhere else or even what someone's already done. Like you don't, I'm not saying, you know, everyone should just copy Dave Fetcher, but there's, there's something like that makes life a lot easier when you look at what's already working, change a little bit of it, but don't feel you have to, you know, come up with like a completely new idea. Um, I saw, I don't know if you've seen, um, potion, um, or like yes. super. Yep. Yeah. So yep. Super yep. has been really successful, basically a way to make websites off the back of notion. Um, and someone a couple of months ago like launched Potion, which is like, pretty much the same thing, but it's obviously got a bit of a new take on it and it's in a really you know growing market and it's, it's worked really nicely. So yeah, I think just, just don't reinvent the wheel. I love it. Love to see it. Uh, Lee also mentions trying to decide if, uh, if to rework a previous project uh, to sell it or do both. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so you're thinking about uh, reworking it. Okay, all right. So, um, do you have any suggestions on that, or anything to think about of uh, trying out both projects same time, selling one off, anything like that? Yeah, I think I think it's very uh, dependent on on how it's doing. Like if it's if it's growing and stuff, then um, I think you know maybe there's, there's something to be said for just doubling down. Um, so it really depends if it, if it's getting any traction or not. Um, also, I guess like know yourself and know what kind of person you are and whether you like splitting between different things. Like I really know that I struggle with that. And I look in, in all of these people on Twitter who have like like four different little SaaS projects um, and they're growing them all. Um, I could never do that. I, I don't think I'd like sleep at night. Um, so I know that I need one thing that I'll, I'll think about like most of the time. Um, and yeah, that's, that's like my approach. But yeah, I think, you know, if you know yourself that you can manage more than one, then, then go for it. Excellent. Excellent. All right, y'all. Perfect. Everyone. And uh, Andy, if you can stay for a moment, but uh, everyone, thank you so much for being here today. It was an awesome chat. Remember, if you have more questions for Andy, make sure that you go follow him on Twitter. We dropped the link down below. If you're interested in data fetcher and understanding more about this, remember, tech, check out data fetcher. Dot io the link is down below we'll put it in the description and we've been dropping it in the chat all uh, all morning 
or wherever you're watching this from, whatever time zone. Uh, and make sure to uh, continue to focus on the important things to move forward, to start building with purpose and action over ideas, y'all. You are doing great things. We'll be back next week with another live stream. And don't forget, there's a new video dropping tomorrow talking about AI in Palterion. Uh, check out that video that's going to be dropping at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So again, thank you for being here. Everyone in the chat, you are all, all beautiful people. You're wonderful. Keep building out there. And again, Andy, thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much. It's been awesome.